Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Title Blades. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as we play through two out of the game's four overall rounds. Now, I would like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of videos like this in the future, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with nice bonuses, like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here we have the game set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now before I begin, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I am showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. The other thing I'd like to mention before we start is the fact that today I am filming this Title Blades tutorial along with the Angler's Cove expansion. Now this adds several things to the base game, and as we are going through the tutorial, I will point out when a component or mechanic is specific to the expansion. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. As you can see, each player is in control of a specific character, and all of us are training to become Tidal Blades. Now, Tidal Blades are defenders of the people, and they defend everyone against gigantic monsters that emerge from the fold. Now, the fold is a barrier that was put in place to try and keep these monsters out, but recently the monsters have found a way to push through it, and they are now threatening the city. So, what we are going to be doing as Tidal Blades in training is moving around to a wide variety of different locations, and at those locations we can activate various actions which will give us resources, as well as potentially more dice, and then we can use those dice to compete in a variety of challenges that are held at the game's three different arenas. Now, when we compete in these challenges, we will gain various attributes that are tracked on our player boards, and the higher these attributes go up, the more benefits we get as we continue to play through the game. Now, one other thing that we can do is head out to the fold. When we go over there, we can then use our dice to attack these monsters and try to fend them off from the city. When we do that, we will also be able to gain attributes, which is great, but that is a dangerous thing to partake, and every time you use a die against a monster, you permanently lose it, whereas you get to keep the dice you use during challenges. Now, I did mention that today we are playing with the Angler's Cove expansion, and one of the things that adds is the Angler's Cove board. Now, this adds several very powerful places that we can send our characters, but every time we visit this location, we have to take an outcast token, and the player who has the highest value worth of outcast tokens at the end of the game will lose five victory points, because taking these powerful actions is not something that's looked on favorably by the tournament judges. Speaking of the judges, as we go throughout the game, players will have many opportunities to advance their token up on this championship board. Once the game is over, players will get points from this board as well as a wide variety of other sources, and the player with the most points at the end of the game will be the winner. Now, the game itself is going to take place over four rounds, and as you can see, there are different colored D8 dice associated with some of them. Now, when we attack the monsters and perform challenges, we are going to roll the current danger die, and as we proceed through the game, we will roll a more and more dangerous die, which will make those various encounters more challenging. The final thing I'd like to mention in this overview is the fact that the base game of Tidal Blades comes with a variety of different modules and advanced components that you can play with. One of those involves flipping this board over, and then you actually play through five rounds with a tryout round earlier on, and that makes the game longer. The next thing that you can play with are these legendary challenges, and these are more complicated but also give very good rewards. I would like to mention that technically we are playing with a few of these legendary challenges over in this stack because that is integrated into the Angler's Cove expansion, and I'll describe how those differ later on in the tutorial. During setup, players can also shuffle this deck of advanced market cards into the market deck, which provide a wide variety of different effects when you play with them. There is also a special announcement module that you can play with, which takes the place of the personal goals that I will be describing later on in the tutorial. And I wanted to show you all of these different options, but I will not be talking about the specifics of how any of these work. Today we are using the base mechanics for Tidal Blades, plus of course everything that comes into the game with the Angler's Cove expansion. Well, I think it's now time to start playing the game. For today's tutorial, we are going to be playing as Sagashi over here, and we have the starting player token, which means we can take the first turn of the game. So let's focus over here, and I would like to point out that Sagashi is the one new playable character that is added to the game with the Angler's Cove expansion. 
Now, I'd also like to point out that in this tutorial, we are using the first play setup, which means we have gone through and found the components that have a little compass in the top right corner, and we are going to be playing with those. So these are three goals that I will talk about later on, but one of them has the compass, so that is the one we are playing with, and the others can be put back into the box. So let's take our turn, and the way this works is we are going to move our character figure either from our board or from another location in the middle of the table to a location in order to perform its actions. So we can focus out here where we have a wide variety of different areas we can go. Now, as you can see, underneath our character, there are these two action discs, and I'll talk about those soon. And when we send our character out, we can either go onto an open action spot like these over here, or if we want to go to a specific board, but all of the action spots are full, we can go off to the side and still do some things in that area. Now, at the moment, there is nothing blocked, so we could go anywhere. And I think let's head over to the Chronosium. In particular, I think we want to go to the Guard Tower. Next up, if we did go onto an action, we can immediately perform the action that's there. And for the Guard Tower, that shows one blue novice die. Now, that means we can take one of these. And as you can see, there are many different dice in the game. Now, at the start of the game, each player has two of these white novice dice in front of us, and then the initiate dice are one level better. Now, the blue initiate dice have some resilience and synergy symbol faces on them, and over here, the red initiate dice show spirit as well as focus. Now, one step above that are elite dice. These are still separated out with the resilience and the synergy versus the spirit and focus, but these dice have no blanks on them. They also have a couple of faces that give you an option. Lastly, from here, these are the best dice, and they are guild dice. There are three of each of the four types, and they are specific to a type of attribute. These are specific to synergy, these over here for resilience, then focus, and finally spirit. Now, there are ways to upgrade our dice throughout the game, but there are also ways to just get specific dice. So once again, we are going to the guard tower, and we can take a single one of these blue initiate dice, and we can add it to our active die pool. As you can see, that's right over here with the two novice dice in it. So we can put that right over there, and that has completed the guard tower action. After this, it's now time to take the island bonus. As you can see, the Chronosium says we get to draw a stunt card whenever we place anywhere on this island, including if we went off to the side and didn't actually place onto an action. So that means we can draw a stunt card from the top of this deck and then add it into our hand, and we can hold as many of these as we want. Now this says Midnight Training, and stunt cards can be played at any point during our turn, but we can only play at most one stunt card per turn. So let's come back to our area, and as you can see on Midnight Training, it says when we play this stunt card, we will gain the reward that matches our spirit trait level. Now, the spirit trait is tracked over here, and as you can see, every one of the traits in the game starts at 1. So if we were to use this right now, we would get the 1 spirit level, which would give us 1 shell, which is not bad. But if we waited until our spirit got up to the 2 spot, then that would actually give us a new novice die. Now, getting dice is a good thing, although it is worth noting that between our active and spent die pools, we can only have six dice total. Now, our spirit is technically right over there, and I think for now, let's hold on to this. It's worth noting that the spirit trait is mainly focused on making these stunt cards better. Every stunt card is associated with your spirit trait when you play it. After taking the island's bonus, the next thing we can potentially do on our turn is compete in a challenge. As you can see, we started off with three challenges in our hand, and each challenge is associated with one of the arenas in the game. Now, you can see this symbol matches up with the Chronosium, so that means this Micronic Plates Challenge can only be undertaken at the Chronosium. Well, we are over here already, so let's go ahead and perform the Micronic Plates Challenge. So we can place this over here, and the next thing that we have to do is select the dice that we are going to use for this challenge. We can only use dice that are currently in our active dice pool, and we can only select a number of dice equal to our current focus amount. As you can see, our current focus is 1, so we can select one of these dice, and I figure we'll use this initiate die there. But then, in addition to that, we can eat food in order to add plus 1 to the number of dice that we roll. Now, we do have two food right over here, so I think let's spend one of our food, and now we can take one of our novice dice and add that into our pool. We could technically have done this again, but I think having two dice for this challenge is going to be good enough. Next up, we have to take the appropriate danger die for the round. 
In the first round of the game, we roll this white danger die. It has six of these single X spots on it and two blanks. Now, when we roll these dice, we don't want to see these X's. And with that in mind, you can see in the second and third rounds of the game, that will unlock the yellow danger die. That one still does have a couple of blanks, but it also has a double X mark, which you certainly do not want to roll. And in the final round of the game, you roll the orange danger die, which has several of the double X sides and only one blank. So let's see how we do. In this case, we got a question mark on our initiate die. We also got a focus on the novice die and an X on the danger die. Now again, this has a three quarters chance of rolling an X, so that's not too surprising. The next thing that we have to do is deal with the danger die. Because it rolled a face with at least one X, that means we have to either remove one of our dice from the challenge back to the supply, or we can spend a shell from our supply and put it onto our shell shield in order to absorb an X. Now we have two shells, so I think we should definitely do this. And it's worth noting that if this had been two X's and we did not spend two shells, then we would still just lose one die. You have to have at least one X showing to make that happen. But of course, in order to not remove a die, it would cost two shells to block that face. Now that the danger die has been dealt with, we can look at our roll. Now this question mark means that can apply to any of the four traits in the game. So this is probably the best result that we could have gotten from this initiate die because it does have a blank side and then a couple of the synergy and a couple of the resilience. Now we can put this right over here because what we're trying to do with this challenge is fulfill all of the traits that are showing. Now this is showing two of the synergy traits. So this question mark will cover that one up. But this one over here shows a focus, which is of course not synergy. Now, at this moment, we could stop or we could roll our other dice again. If we stopped, we would be successful with this challenge because, as you can see, it does show two synergy spots, but the right-hand one has a dotted line around it. Now, that is a push-it spot, which means you can fill this if you want to, which will increase your rewards, but in order to complete this challenge, you just need one synergy. Now, let's pretend we had not rolled any synergy at all. Well, we could still decide to not go on with this challenge, but I think that would probably not be a good idea. Now, if this was a challenge that had multiple symbols like this, and we only filled one of those, but it was not completed, we could still stop. And if we did, we would get the reward for the spot that we covered up, but we would not get to keep the card itself. Now, in this case, we did roll a question mark. So if we stopped, we would get the reward of the spot we covered up, and we would get to keep the card. Now, I am partly tempted to push it because we are technically allowed to roll these dice as many times as we want to, but we have to roll the danger die every single time. So that means that there is a threat with every die roll that we will potentially lose dice or have to spend our shells in order to mitigate those X's. Now, let's take a closer look at the novice die. As you can see, it has a blank and then it has a face for each of the four traits and a question mark. That means in order to get a synergy, we have a one in three chance of making that happen. And I don't think that is going to be worth it considering we have just one more shell over here. Now, there are ways to actually spend our shells that are over here on our shell shield, but I'll describe how those work later on in the tutorial. I think at this point, let's not push our luck and stop with the challenge. So we can put this back over onto the round board. And then we are going to gain one advancement for each trait that we were able to cover up with a die that we rolled. So in this case, we covered up one of the synergy traits. So this can move over to the two spot. Once again, if we had failed at trying to complete this one, but we covered up one of these resilience spots, we would still go up once on the resilience dial, even though the card itself would be removed. Now, in this case, we did complete this challenge, which means we get to keep this card and tuck it underneath our board. As you can see, there are spots for each of the three arena types, and we just tuck this in under like that. And whenever we see a hexagon symbol like this, that is endgame points that we get to add once the game is over. Now, these other symbols are potentially important, and I'll describe how those impact the game later on. And the final thing I'd like to mention is that every time you have a full set of one of each arena type challenge done, you will then move your marker up twice on the champion board. Now, I'll talk about the champion board in more detail later. And at this point, we now need to take all of the dice that we used during this challenge and we move them over into the spent dice area. Now, there are ways to move these dice back into our active pool, and I will discuss that one later on in the tutorial. The next thing we should do is focus on our synergy dial. This tells us how many character cards we will have in front of us at any point. At the start of the game, our synergy was one, which is why we had one character card here. 
but then when we advanced one spot on the dial, we got to the two area, and that shows a character card icon. This means we can gain a new character card and add it face up in front of us, and once we go up to the three level, we can do that once again. As you can see, in order to go from two to three, we actually have to bump twice on the synergy dial, and in order to go from three to four, that would be a couple more bumps. Now, as you can see, we can take a cards from this deck. These have been shuffled up at the start of the game, and every time we gain a new card, we take the top two from the deck, we then analyze them, we choose one, and we put the other one to the bottom of the deck. So let's take a close look at these cards. The first one is Drew's Presence. It says, before fighting a monster, you can upgrade one of your dice to the next level. Now, Drew is our companion. You can see they're hanging out on our leg over there. And in fact, they are on top of our head on our figurine. And that is definitely a nice way to be more formidable when we go against the monsters. The other option that we have is Boundless Mobility. It looks like we have the ability to kind of hang glide around. And it says down here, when you are alone, you may take the Chronosium, Droska Ring, or Lamara Stadium Island bonus instead of the bonus for the island that we are specifically on. Now, alone means we are on an island that has no other character figures specifically on that island. Now, these are both pretty good, but I think I have to give the edge to Drew's presence. We are planning on fighting monsters many times throughout the game, and getting a free upgrade on a die seems great. So we can place this right over here, and then Boundless Mobility will go to the bottom of our character deck. Now, at this point, we have two character cards in front of us, and I'd actually like to draw your attention to Flamboyant Contestant. This is our starting character card, and at the bottom, it says, after attempting a challenge or fighting a monster, we gain one shell if we rolled at least one question mark on a die. Now, it says attempting, so that means even if we were not successful with the challenge, we could activate this, and we did indeed roll at least one question mark. So that means our flamboyant contestant character card will activate and we can take one shell from the supply. The final thing I'd like to focus on before we end our turn is our goal card here. As you can see, that is gear repairs and up at the top, it says we are going to try to level up our trait dials. Now, if we are able to level up at least 11 times throughout the game, this will be worth a bonus 7 victory points to us. And if we bump our traits up at least 13 times, we get 10 victory points. Now, this is the uh, card that you use the first time you play the game, and it's worth noting that when everyone is doing this, you can leave all of these face up for your first game if you like, or you could keep these face down since they are technically hidden goals that we are all working towards. So we'll leave this one face up, and we'll leave the other ones face down for now. All right, our turn is done, which means play is going to move clockwise over to the yellow player, who is Axel. Now, they have their character on the board, so they can head out to an island. After thinking through their options, they want to head to the Droska Ring, and in particular, they are going to the Glass Forger's Guild. Now, this action is going to simply give them two shells, which they can add into their supply, and I'd like to point out that the Drifter's Dock would give them one fruit, and then they could discard up to two of these market cards and then draw new ones out. And the last action spot over here is the Desert Caravan, and that lets you refresh dice from your spent die pool to your active die pool up to your resilience amount. Now, I'll talk about refreshing dice in more detail later on. And after visiting the Glass Forger's Guild, Axel can now perform the action for the Droska Ring Island. As you can see, that says they can buy a card from the market, or they can gain a single fruit into their supply. At the moment, they have three fruit available to them, and they have decided to buy a card from the market. In order to do this, they have to pay the associated things on the left side of the card to then gain the rewards on the right side. Now, I would like to point out that the Coral Harvest over here comes in with the Angler's Cove expansion, and as you can see, instead of spending fruit, you have to actually gain an Outcast token. Now, I'll talk about these Outcast tokens in more detail later on. At this moment, it looks like Axel has decided they would like to take this card up here. Now, that is going to cost them all three of the fruit they had in front of them. After paying, they can now take these rewards. This one is going to give them a red initiate die that will go into their dice pool, and then this lets them draw a new challenge. Now, whenever you draw a challenge, you can either take the top one from this shuffled up deck, or you could take any over here from this face-up row. As you can see, there are four single cards and then a deck of cards here. Now, whenever you play Tidal Blades without any expansions, you simply deal out five random single cards, but when you are playing with the Angler's Cove expansion, you instead build a deck for this spot. 
Now, that deck is going to have the Judge Advanced Challenge cards put into it, and these come with the base game of Tidal Blades, and those are shuffled up with all of the Angler's Cove challenges that look like this. Now, that goes right over here, and you can always take the top card from this deck if you like. In this case, it looks like Axel would like to take this Crowbax Wrath Judge Challenge, and as you can see in the top corner, it shows the Judge symbol instead of having an arena. That means this can only be attempted at the judge's location specifically, and it's not associated with an arena. If you complete it, that will simply advance you up once on the champion board. That has revealed one of the Angler's Cove expansion challenges. That one is a sabotage mission that says rigged race, and if you complete this one, then each other player will go one space back on the champion board, and you will have to take an outcast token, which could end up costing you end game points. So, Axel can add this challenge to their hand, but before they do so, I would like to point out that the judge figure is currently over at Lambara Stadium. Now, whenever you complete a challenge at an arena where the judge is, you get to go up once on the champion board at the top of the game. But as you can see, this specific challenge can be performed at any of the arenas. It just has to be the arena that does indeed have the judge. Well, Axel has now taken all of these rewards and the next... Well, Axel is done taking the rewards, and now a new market card can refill that spot. In this case, the new one says you can spend three fruit in order to take a challenge, and you can increase any one of the traits on your board. At this point, Axel could now perform a challenge at the Droska Ring, but it looks like they've decided they are going to wait on that and instead just end their turn. This means it's now time for Cayman to go, and they have decided to go to the Citadel of Time. Now, as you can see, there are a couple of different icons showing up here, and whenever you see a location with a dotted line like this, that means any number of characters can actually go onto that spot to perform that action. Now, in this case, it looks like Cayman actually wants to go over to the Temple of the Breaking Wave, and this is split into three different locations. This means Cayman has to select one of these spots, and they've decided to go into the middle. Now, that is going to give them three fruit that they can take from the supply immediately, and then they can discard two challenges from the challenge row. Now, it's worth noting that up to three of the figures can go onto the spot, so that means in the future someone still can go to the Temple of the Breaking Wave to get three shells or to pick up a challenge. So they can discard two of these, and they're going to get rid of the Tidal Master and the Deep Dive, and then after that, two new cards will be drawn from the top of the deck. This one is Walk the Lava Path, and the other one is Withstand the Waterfall. After that, they can perform the island action, which says they can choose or draw two challenges. Now, that means they can select from these face-up cards over here, and they can also draw from the face-down deck if they feel like it. The first card they want is Walk the Lava Path, and as soon as this is removed, a new one is immediately going to refill it, so they can take that one if they wanted to. After considering their options, their second card is going to be drawn from the top of their deck, and it's worth noting that players can hold any number of these challenges in their hand at any given time. So they have finished the island action, and they cannot actually perform any challenges at the Citadel of Time because there is no arena at this location. One thing they can do, however, is activate their character card, which they started the game with. Now that is Ancient Rivalry, and it says whenever they visit the Citadel of Time or the Chronosium, they gain one shell. So they can place this over here, and that has finished up their turn. This means we can now take our turn, and currently Sagashi is over at the Chronosium. Now what we are going to do is pick up our figure as well as all but one of our action discs, and we are then going to move this to a new spot in order to perform our turn. Now technically, if we wanted to, we could leave that action spot and go right back onto the Chronosium if we wanted to, but we are not allowed to go back onto the same location because there is already an action disc there. In addition to that, we cannot go onto any spot that has any opponent's figures or any opposing action discs on those spots. Now I think what we want to do on this turn is leave the Chronosium and head over to the Angler's Cove. In this case, let's head over to the Entangler's Hideout. So let's focus over here, and all of the action spots on Angler's Cove are significantly more powerful than the other action spots that we've seen in the game. At the Coral Mine, you can take a Novice Dice, two Fruit, and two Shells. Down here at the Battle Pit, you can take a Challenge as well as a Stunt Card. Now at the Entangler's Hideout, there is once again powerful effects. The first thing that we can do is take any of the Market Cards without paying anything for that card. Now I think what we should do is take this card here, 
We don't have to pay the three fruit, which is awesome. And then we can take one challenge as well as increase any of our traits by one. In this case, I think we want to take the hold the fort challenge from the row and then we can replace that with a new one. This one being capture the crab. After that, we can increase the trait value on any of these dials by one. And I think let's gain one focus. That brings us from a one to a two. So that means in future challenges and attacks against monsters, we can roll two dice before we eat fruit to add additional dice. After that, we have to refill the market, and then we can refresh a number of dice equal to our current resilience trait. As you can see, our resilience is one, so that means we can refresh one die, and that means we take it from our spent dice area and move it to our active dice area. So far, this has been a great turn for us, but now we have to activate the action of Angler's Cove. Now the action on all of the other items is beneficial, but over here at Angler's Cove, the first thing that we have to do is draw an outcast token, and we don't want these. Now we have to take a random one, and they have a value on the back that ranges from 1 to 4, and this one has a 2. Now we are going to keep this hidden from our opponents, and once the game is over, we will reveal all of them, and the player with the highest overall value of outcast tokens is going to lose 5 victory points, and if multiple players tie for having the most, they all lose those 5 points. In addition to that, if any player reveals an outcast token that looks like this, then that means every single player is going to lose a single victory point for each of their outcast tokens, whether or not they have the highest outcast value. Now, there are just a few of these shuffled in amongst these stacks, so I can kind of hide this one real quick so we're not sure where it is anymore. And at the moment, we know that we have this two value. Now, that means we have the most, so we want to make sure to not take too many of these while our opponents aren't taking them, but I think it's pretty likely our opponents will also visit Angler's Cove because these actions are so powerful. Ultimately, you just want to make sure that your outcast score is not the highest. While we are discussing outcast tokens, I would now like to draw your attention to a couple of these market cards in the row. Now, these were added into the market deck because we are playing with the Angler's Cove expansion, and this top one says spread rumors, and if you spend three fruit, you can then cause all of your opponents to draw one outcast token, which means they will potentially have a higher outcast rating than you will at the end of the game. The next one is Coral Harvest, and for that one, you can gain one outcast token in order to get a shell and a novice die. So that is pretty powerful, but of course those outcast tokens can be bad. There is a third type of market card that has been shuffled in here when we're playing with the Angler's Cove, and that looks like this. It says Report Smugglers, and for that you can spend two fruit in order to discard one of your outcast tokens from the game. Well, let's focus back over here because so far we've only completed half of the Angler's Cove action. The second half is good. That one says we may attempt any challenge that's in our hand. With this in mind, I think we should try to complete Hold the Fort. Now, normally, we'd have to be at the Chronosium to complete this one, but again, at Angler's Cove, you can attempt any challenge. Fortunately, we were able to refresh our blue initiate die earlier on in the turn, and since our focus is at two, that means we can roll both of these dice without having to eat any fruit. Next up, we can take the damage die over here, and now it's time to roll all three of these, and we are looking for one or two resilience symbols. So, let's see how we do. In this case, we got a damage, we also got a synergy, and one resilience. Now, this damage can be mitigated by spending one shell, so I think we should do that, and then this will cover that up over there. Now, at this point, we could try to roll again. Uh, we have not rolled a question mark yet, and of course, if we roll a question mark, then our flamboyant contestant character card will give us one shell back. You know what? I think let's risk it. So, we're going to roll both of these. And it looks like we got a Resilience, which is great, and we did get one damage on the damage die. Now, we do want to mitigate that. If we didn't, we'd have to lose one of these dice, so let's spend this shell here. We can then place that over there, and we are certainly going to stop at this point. This means we are going to gain two Resilience, so this will move forward twice. That brings us from the one to the two spot. The second bump means we are still at the two location, and this two means we will be able to refresh and upgrade two of our dice at the end of this round, and I'll talk about those details once we get there. Next up, these dice will go into our spent pool, and we can tuck this under our board, where we can see that that is our second Chronosium type of completed challenge. That has finished the challenge, but before we move on, I do want to point out that if we had completed a challenge that is matched up with the arena where the judge is, we do not get a bonus, because technically we perform that challenge at the Angler's Cove. Our turn is now over, but before we move on, I'd like to talk about the Shell Shield in more detail. 
Now, so far, we have been using this top option that lets us move one shell onto our shell shield to stop an X on the damaged die. Now, the next line over here says we could spend four shells from our shell shield in order to set any one die that we have rolled to any face of our choice. So we can actually use these shells again, even after using them to stop taking a damage. Down here, the final one says we could spend all six shells, if this is full, in order to refresh two dice from our spent pool. At the moment, we have three shells over here, so we are one more away from being able to perform this action later on in the game. But of course, we don't have any shells to place onto our shield, so we should probably focus on getting some more soon. All right, it's now time for Axel to take their second action of the round, and they will move away from the Drosko ring and, of course, leave their action disc behind. Now, they've decided to go to La Mara Stadium, and in particular, they are going to visit Palm Plaza. Now, that says they will get two fruit from the supply, and then they are going to take the starting player token. So they can take this away from us and put it in front of themselves, and that means in the next round of the game, Axel will be the starting player. After that, they can now perform the island action for Lamara Stadium, and that says they can advance the boat and collect rewards. Now, this is going to advance the boat once, and it always goes clockwise around the stadium, and in this case, it lands over there, and that effect means they can draw the top stunt card and put that into their hand. Next up, I'd like to highlight the other two action spots. The repair shop is simple, that just lets you take two shells, but then over here, Racer's Bay says you can move the boat again, and you once again get any associated benefits underneath it. Now, in addition to that, we can see that Axel has a character card that says Racing Engine. Down below, it says that whenever they visit Lamara Stadium, they move the boat an extra space. So they've moved it once already and taken that bonus, and now they can move it again and take this bonus, which is going to give them a shell. So they can add this into their supply, and now Axel has decided to try and complete the High Speed Joust Challenge at Lamara Stadium. As you can see, they have to roll a minimum of two spirit, and they can potentially push it to get a third spirit from this challenge. The first thing they have to do is get their dice. Currently their focus is one, so they can take one die for that, and then they're going to spend both of these fruit to add two more dice so that they have a potential of covering up all three of these spirit symbols. So let's see how they do. Now the danger die does show an X, but so far this has been a great roll. They got two spirit right off the bat, and then that does have a resilience, which is not something they're looking for. Now they have five shells over here, so they are going to spend one of those to stop that X, and they are definitely going to roll again. They are looking for a spirit or a question mark. Now they didn't get it this time, and once again there is a damage, and they really would like to make this happen, so they are going to roll once again, and this time they got it. Now that is the third damage they've taken in a row, but they fortunately were prepared and had a bunch of shells ready. Now they can place this spirit right over there, and they have obviously successfully completed the challenge. They just needed two out of the three to be filled in to make that happen. Now this is going to give them three spirit, so they go one, two, three, and at this point, they're still at the two spirit level, but you may have noticed there are these victory point symbols going around the outside of each of the trait wheels. Once the game is over, players can score each of their trait wheels, and they get points equal to the highest value one that they have met or crossed over. So that means their spirit wheel is now worth one point to them at the end of the game, and if they got it up to there before the game is over, it would be worth two points instead. This also means they are one advancement away from getting to the three spirit spot, and remember, the more spirit you have, the more powerful your stunt cards will be. Next up, they can send all three of these dice to the spent die area, and then tuck this underneath the Lamara Stadium part of their board. And as you can see, that card itself is worth two points to them at the end of the game. Next up, when we look back to Lamara Stadium, we can see that the judge was there watching that challenge be completed by Axel. That means Axel is going to gain a benefit of moving up once on the champion board. That's here above the Citadel of Time, and this means they can move from the left to the right one space. Now, at the end of the game, players will get points equal to the highest victory point value that they met or moved past on this board, and it's worth noting only one player can reach this last spot here, which is worth 10 victory points. In addition to that, at the end of the game, the player who is farthest down this board is going to get three points, the second farthest will get two, and the third farthest will get three. The last thing to mention up here is at the end of each of the game's rounds, the player who is farthest up on the champion board can put one of their tokens onto the associated spot, and that will be worth an extra victory point to them at the end of the game. 
Well, Axel's turn is almost over, but remember, players can spend up to one stunt card at any point during their turn, and Axel has decided to spend theirs. Now they can flip this over, and that says Illicit Training, and this is actually a stunt card that comes in with the Angler's Cove expansion. Now this says they have to take a Outcast token randomly from the stacks, and then they can increase one of their trade dials for every spirit they have. As you can see, they currently have two spirit, so that means they can do two trait dial increases. In this case, they want to increase their resilience by one, so that brings them from one to two, and then they will increase their synergy from one to two as well. Now that is going to let them draw two cards from the top and then keep one, and the other will go to the bottom of their deck. Now the one they kept is actually a shell upgrade. As you can see, that says Shock Trainer, and down below, it says they have to tuck this card under their shell shield. This upgrade adds a new permanent use for shells. In this case, it says they can spend three shells from their shield to upgrade one die once per turn. So they can tuck this underneath their shield, and now they have a new way to spend these shells. The other ways are good, of course, but having more options is also great. All right, Axel is done, so now Cayman can take their turn. After considering their options, they would like to leave the Citadel of Time, and they're going to head over to the Kronosian. Now they're going to go to the Blade Advisor, which means they can take a Red Initiate die. Next up, they can perform the Island action, which lets them draw the top stunt card. And then they have the character card, Ancient Rivalry, which gives them a shell whenever they visit the Citadel of Time or the Kronosian. So that means they will get a shell just by visiting this island. After that, they are going to try and complete the Mesh Crawl Challenge at the Kronosian. Next up, they have to build their die pool. They have a focus of one, so they can place this over here, and they've decided to eat one fruit to add one die. Now they're looking for two spirit total, and they can now roll the dice. And in this case, they got a question mark, a focus, and a blank on the danger die. So they can use this question mark for one spirit, and they could stop right now if they wanted to, but they are definitely going to roll again. They do have five shells over here. So this time they got a question mark and one X on the danger die which means this has gone very well for them. They do have to spend one shell to mitigate that danger symbol, but then the question mark means that, that can be another spirit, and they are now certainly going to stop. So they will gain two spirit, which brings them there. Then these dice will go to their spent pool, and they can tuck this under their board. At this moment, they could spend their stunt card if they wanted to, but they've decided to hold onto it, so now their turn is over. This means it would now be our turn. However, whenever we move our figure, we have to bring one action disc with us and leave one behind. We have just one underneath us, which means we cannot bring any new ones, and that means we cannot take any more actions in this round, and the same can be said for all of the players. This means in the first round of the game, all players will just take two turns total. This means we've reached the end of the round, and the first thing that we have to do is check to see if the monsters invade. In order to do this, we have to focus over here on the fold, which is an area we have not talked about just yet. Now, our characters can head over here to actually attack these monsters, and I'll talk about that in detail later on, but at this point, we have to look over here to see if they invade. The way this works is we are going to roll this die, and it has faces that go from 1 up to 8. So, let's see what number we get, and it's a 5. Now, what we have to do is check over here to see these two locations where the monsters could be. Now the fold's edge is far away, while the inner reef is quite close to the city. Now if this number matches up with a spot that has a monster in it, then it will invade, and 1 to 5 on the invasion die will activate a monster close to the city at the inner reef. If this was a 6, 7, or 8, that means the giant mud crab would have invaded, and what that would have meant is that the invasion action on that monster would activate and hit all players who have not done any damage to that monster just yet. Now, obviously, no one has attacked the giant mud crab, so no damage has happened. So if the giant mud crab had successfully invaded by having this die be a 6, 7, or 8, then everyone would have lost one die, which is pretty punishing. Fortunately for us, that did not happen. After we potentially resolve an invasion, it's time for the monsters to slide down and we get a new one. Now, if a monster was here already, it slides off the board, and then all players who have done no damage to that monster will go one space back on the champion board, so you do want to try and do at least one damage before the monster flees after being fended off by the coastal guards. Of course, the giant mud crab is here, so we slide that down, and then we can reveal a new monster from the fold, which will go into the fold's edge spot. 
Now, this is a special type of monster. It is Suspicious Hunters, and this comes into the game when you use the Angler's Cove expansion. As you can see, instead of being a massive monster, this is a team of suspicious hunters, and the invasion effect for this one says you have to draw an outcast token, which effectively means if you don't damage them, then you are seen to maybe be colluding with them. Now, there is a reward associated with doing damage after they are defeated to discard an outcast token, and I'll talk about defeating monsters later on in the tutorial. Well, let's now move on with the end of round phase, and the next thing that we all have to do simultaneously is refresh and upgrade our dice. The way this works is we can refresh a number of dice equal to our resilience level, and every die that is refreshed will become upgraded into the next better type of die. It's worth noting that you can target a die that is already in your active dice pool so that you can upgrade it, but of course you wouldn't be refreshing it because it would have already been in your active die pool. In this case, we have a resilience of two, so I think we should certainly refresh these two dice. So each of these dice will be upgraded, which means they turn into the next best type. This blue initiate die will turn into a blue elite die, and this has no blanks on it. It has a couple of question marks and two die faces that could be synergy or resilience. Now, this novice die can turn into a blue initiate or a red initiate, and I think we are going to try to do damage to monsters this round, and both of them are more susceptible to damage that comes in from blue dice, so let's take one of those. Both of these will go into our active die area, and now let's see how our opponents do their upgrades. We can see Axel has a resilience of two, so they are going to refresh these. And the red initiate will turn into a red elite, and their novice will turn into a blue initiate. Lastly, Cayman unfortunately has a resilience of just one, so they are going to refresh this die. And that will turn into a red elite die. After this, it's time for all players to take all of their action discs and their figures and remove them from the board. After that, the judge is going to move to the next arena, and that is always going to be clockwise, so they'll head from Lamara Stadium over to the Droska Ring. Finally, we have to check the tournament standings. Currently, Axel has the highest standing on the champion board, so that means they can take one of their tokens and put it over the round one spot to show that they will get one extra point at the end of the game. If there was a tie between players for being the most, then no one would put their token down, so fortunately for Axel, just one bump up on the champion board turned into an extra point for them. The final thing that we have to do is advance the round token forward, and now that we are in the second round of the game, that means we will be rolling the yellow danger die and we can remove the white one. In addition to that, all players are going to gain an additional action disc, so that means everyone will take three actions before this round is over. With that in mind, let's go ahead and start. We can see that Axel is the starting player, so they can head out to an island. And they've decided to go to Lamara Stadium. They're going to head over to Racers Bay, which is going to move the boat once, and that will give them a champion board advancement. This brings them to the one victory point spot. Next up, they can perform the action of Lamara Stadium, which moves the boat forward once, and that is going to give them two fruit. After that, they have a racing engine, which says they get to move again whenever they visit Lamara Stadium, so that means they can now take a challenge card. In this case, they want to take Tangling Platform, which is associated with Lamara Stadium, and then that will be replaced by Finding the True Keysmith. Next up, they want to try and complete this challenge they just picked up at Lamara Stadium, which means they have to take the yellow danger die, and then they can take one die from their active pool and roll it. Now they do have an elite red die, which is a pretty good one for this challenge. They could spend a fruit to roll another one. However, their only other die in their active pool has a one in six chance of actually making the focus that they would need. So they've decided they're not gonna worry about trying to push it. They're just gonna try and get the single focus that this challenge needs to be completed. So they can roll the dice and they got a blank on the danger die, which was really fortunate and they got the focus. So that was a great roll overall for them. They don't have to spend any of their shells. They can then take one focus, which brings them to two and they are done with this challenge. So they can tuck this under their board. After that, they can put this die into their spent area and that's finished their turn. This means Cayman can go and they've decided to visit the Droska ring and in particular, they're going to go to the Desert Caravan. Now that lets them refresh a number of dice equal to their resilience. And the resilience is one, so they can refresh one die from their spent dice pool to their active die pool. Now at this moment, they have decided to spend their stunt card, which is a convincing offer. 
That says when you visit the Droska Ring, you can choose a market card with a fruit cost up to your spirit trait level and immediately take it. Now this is in addition to the Droska Ring effect, and their spirit level is at 2. This means they can take this market card without paying the cost, and that is going to increase their spirit by 1. And then this card will be replaced with the top one from the deck. Now that costs 3 fruit, and it gives you a novice die, and you get to go up once on the champion board. And it looks like Cayman is going to buy a card from the market, and in fact, this is the one they want to purchase. They have 4 fruit total, so they can definitely spend the 3 fruit that they need to take this, and then that will give them 1 novice die, and they'll go up one time on the champion board. After that, we can see a new market card, and this one lets you get a novice die and a shell, and now Cayman has the option of performing a challenge at the Droska Ring. Currently, the judge is at the Droska Ring, so if they complete a challenge here, they will go up once on the champion board, and they have indeed decided to try moving targets. This just needs a single focus to complete, and they can push it to get two focus. With that in mind, they can now take their dice. They, of course, need the yellow danger die. Their focus is one, so they can take one die for that, and then they are going to spend this fruit, or I guess eat the fruit, in order to add another die to their pool. So let's see how they do. Now they got an X on the danger die, <laughs> and then two question marks. Well, this is a pretty quick challenge. Now they do have to spend one shell to make up for that damage, but then the two question marks means they easily overcome this challenge, and they were easily able to push it to get another focus. So that means they are going to gain two focus, and then they can take this and put it underneath their player board. After that, they'll go up once on the champion board because the judge watched them complete this challenge. Just like that, they are now tied with Axel at the second spot on the board. Well, it's our turn, and I think let's go to the Droska Ring so that we can try to complete this challenge. That would get us a spirit level, which would increase the potency of this stunt card when we play it. As you can see right now, if we played it, our spirit level is 1, so we just get a shell. But if we get up to even spirit level 2, this could give us a novice die. And if we get it even higher up, it could be a better die than that. When we arrive, we can see there are two action spots left. And remember, if all of the action spots are filled in, you can still go to an island and perform the island effect and potentially perform a challenge if there is an arena. Now, I think we want to go to Drifter's Dock. That is going to get us one fruit, and we can also get rid of two items in the market to draw two more. Currently, we have two fruit, so we could take this one later on in our turn. So let's get rid of these two, and maybe we'll find better options for the two fruit that we have. Now, this one lets you get five shells if you spend three fruit, and this one lets you get two of the red initiate die if you spend four fruit. Now, that is super powerful, but unfortunately, we only have two fruit, so now we could either gain a fruit or buy a card from the market, and I think it's worth it. Let's go ahead and spend our two fruit to take this card here. That is going to get us one shell, and it is also going to get us one more novice die into our active pool. Next up, we have to refill the market once again. This costs two fruit and lets you draw a challenge card. After that, let's now try to complete the Droska Lap Challenge. So we have to build our die pool, and unfortunately, we're not very well situated for this. I would like to get at least one spirit, and realistically, I think going for one spirit is the best plan that we have for this turn. We could use either of these. I suppose this does have two question marks on it, but that would also spend this, which we would then have to refresh. Now, I suppose we're probably going to want to refresh before we try to attack most likely the giant mud crab later on in this round. So you know what? I think I've talked myself into it. Let's try and hopefully hit one of these two question marks. So let's roll the dice. And it looks like we got a single X. We got one question mark, and we got this one, which could be a synergy or a resilience. Unfortunately, we were looking for that question mark. Now we have to spend this shell if we don't want to lose any of these dice, and then this will go over here. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, we have no more shells over here, so if we rolled once again, then we would actually lose a die if we rolled any damage, and that would certainly be bad. Fortunately, we have four shells in our shell shield, which means we could get rid of all of these to set this die to a face of our choice in order to actually get that extra spirit. Now, if we don't do that, we could potentially use these shells to set a die face later on when we are fighting a monster, and I think that might be a little bit more important than right now setting this to gain us one more spirit. 
So overall, I think I regret adding this die into the pool, considering it didn't seem like it was necessary. But you know what? Before we rolled the dice, it seemed like it was a good way to make sure we were able to complete this challenge. So we're going to save those shells. We can then put both of these dice into our spent area, and we only gain one spirit. But that is enough to get to the second spirit level. Now we can tuck this underneath our board. And because we completed a challenge in front of the judge, we will go up once on the champion board. This will bring us up to the first spot, and I think we are now done with our turn. After considering their options, they've decided to head over to the Chronoseum, and in particular to the Guard Tower. That is going to give them a blue initiate die, and then they can draw the top stunt card, and now they can consider if they want to try and complete a challenge there. After looking at their options, they do indeed want to try, and this one is called Unlocking the Yamazi Crate. Now this one requires a single synergy to complete, and they can push it to get a second synergy. Two synergy would be enough for them to get another character card, so that is what they're going to try to go for. They have to take the yellow danger die, of course, and then they are going to commit both of these blue initiate dice to try and get the two synergy that they need. So let's see how the first roll goes. In this case, they got a question mark, a resilience, and one damage. Remember, one face on this has double damage, which is certainly not something they want to see, but one is fine. Now, they are going to mitigate that one with a shell. This question mark will take care of one synergy that they need, and they've decided to roll again. This time, they got the synergy, and there is another damage. So they are going to mitigate that damage with a shell, and their shell shield is almost full at this point, and now they can fill this in. So they have successfully completed this challenge, and that is going to give them two synergy, and as soon as they get their second synergy, that unlocks another character card for them. So they can draw the top two cards from their deck, and the one they've decided to go with is the Nagian Heritage. Down below it says you may use your synergy trait level in place of focus. Currently their synergy is at 3 and their focus is at 2, so that is actually a pretty great card for them. This means they can roll 3 dice in challenges and while attacking without having to spend any fruit. Alright, they are done with their turn, so now Cayman can go. After considering their options, they want to head over to the Chronosium, and in particular they want to go to the Floating Gardens. Now that is going to get them one novice die, and it will also give them one fruit. In addition to this, for being at the Chronosium, they can draw a stunt card, and then their character card says they get one shell every time they visit the Chronosium or the Citadel of Time, so they can also take a shell. At this point, they could try to complete a challenge at the Chronosium, but it looks like they've decided against it, and they are now done with their turn. Alright, it's time for us to go. And once again, I feel the pull of these strong abilities over at Angler's Cove. I'm a little surprised my opponents haven't gone over here just yet, but I'm sure before the game is over, that will happen. Now for us, I think let's go to the Coral Mine. The reason for that is because currently we don't have any shells, and we don't have any fruit, and getting an extra novice die is certainly great. So this is going to take care of all of those problems for us. We can take the novice die, and this is actually our fifth die total. Remember, you can only ever have a total of six dice between both your active and spent pools. Now, after that, we are going to get two shells, and we will get two fruit from the supply. But then, of course, since we visited Angler's Cove, we have to take the top one of these, and it's a three. Dang, I did not want to see that. We are already up to five, so we should probably cool it on going to Angler's Cove and potentially try to find some ways to get rid of these before the game is over. Up next, we could attempt any challenge. And at the moment, we do have one challenge left in our hand. This one is the Ring of Chaos, and it would require us to hit two Resilience. Now, we could potentially make this happen, but for our last turn of the round, I would like to attack a monster, and if we use these, then they would be in the spent pool, and we would not have the dice that we need to attack that monster. So I think let's go ahead and save this and not attempt a challenge this turn. Our turn is done, so now Axel can go, and this is their last action of the round, and they've decided to head to the fold, and in particular, they want to go to the fold's edge. Now, this has a dotted line around it, so any number of players can visit this, and the first thing that happens is they can take three shells from the supply. After taking these, they can perform the action of the area, which says that they can fight a monster that's associated with where they went, and they can take a bonus die from their specific fighting style. Now, it's worth noting that when you fight monsters, you will lose all dice that you commit to that battle, no matter how the battle goes. So, it looks like Axel is fighting the Suspicious Hunters, which means they now have to build their die pool. 
They will start by taking a yellow die, but you'll notice they don't actually have any dice in their active area. Fortunately for them, they've been planning ahead for this, and they will now play this stun card, which says Sudden Resilience. This lets them refresh a number of dice equal to their spirit trait level, which is currently two, so with that, they are going to refresh both of these blue initiate dice. Now they can add dice to their area, and remember, normally that is based on your focus, but because of their character card, they could actually have that be based off their synergy. Unfortunately for them, they only have two dice in their active pool. They wish they maybe had this one there as well to commit, but in this case, they are just going to commit these two dice to the attack. Now before the attack happens, remember I said they can do this with a bonus die based off of their fighting style. With that in mind, we can focus down here and look at the challenges that they have already completed. Now the monster they are fighting is Suspicious Hunters, and the icon over here is associated with Lamara Stadium. That means the bonus die that they get to roll is dictated by the number of Lamara Stadium challenges that they have completed. The way this works is if a character has completed one of the associated challenge, they get a novice die. If they've completed two, they can take a initiate die. If they've completed three, they could take an elite die. And if they've completed four or more challenges in that arena, they could take any available guild die. Now these are bonus dice. You don't have to spend food for them and you don't need the focus to actually put them in your pool. And of course you lose all the dice at the end of every battle with the monsters. So it will go back to the supply once they are done. In this case, they have two of the Lamara Stadium icons, so that means they can take a initiate level bonus die, and they've decided to take a blue one. So they can add that to their die pool, and now it's time for them to fight. Now this works just like challenges, as they roll dice that match the faces of these available over here on the monster. They can place those dice down, and once they decide to stop, they are going to put their damage tokens down onto each of the spots they filled in. They will also take the associated trait advancement for each of these, and it's worth noting that up here we have some armored spots. That means this resilience right here can only be covered by an initiate level die or better, whereas these down here can be covered by any level die. Once we fight harder monsters in this deck, they might be armored to the point where they can only be damaged with an elite level die or better. So it's time for them to roll. And it looks like they got a damage on the damage dice. They got two blanks, which is a bummer, and they did get one synergy. Now they can put this synergy right over there. They can then spend this in order to mitigate that damage. And at this point, their shell shield is full. Now what they can do is uh, spend four of these to set either of these dice to a face of their choice. They could get rid of all six of these to refresh two of their dice if they wanted to. And they also have this special upgrade down here that lets them spend three of their shells to upgrade one die. After considering these options, they are going to spend three of these shells in order to do this special bonus here. Now they've decided not to upgrade either of these dice. Instead, they are going to upgrade this novice die in their spent pool to a blue initiate. Now they have room to put more shells in and they have decided to roll again. With this roll, they got a blank on the damage die, which is great. They also got a synergy and a question mark. Now, when they put these out, they can put the synergy over there, and the question mark can become a synergy, and that way they have actually done damage to both of the armored positions. Now, a bonus for doing damage to the armored positions is you get a bonus move on the champion board, so they have filled both of these in, which means they move up twice on the champion board. So they'll go up to this spot, which puts them in the lead. After that, they aren't going to roll again because they've used all of their dice. So this means they can now take their damage tokens and swap these out for the dice that they used. After that happens, these dice are going to be put back into the supply. And in the future, when anyone comes to fight the suspicious hunters again, there are only these three slots left available. Now, once all of the spots on a monster are filled up, that is going to kill the monster, and there will be a kill bonus, which will go to the player who does the last damage. Now, there is a reward over here that says you discard an outcast token, and that reward will happen when this monster either leaves play by falling off the fold or by being destroyed by any one player. Now, that reward will go to every player who's done at least one damage, so that means Axel knows that they can discard an outcast token at some point later on in the game. It's also worth noting that when the game is over, all of these damage tokens are going to be worth one point to them, so they have just essentially banked three more points for themselves. Finally, Axel can now move up their traits equal to the damage types that they did. 
Now they did one synergy damage, which moves them over there, and they did two resilience damage. That means their resilience goes up twice, and unfortunately they are just one step away from getting to the three spot, although at the moment they only have two dice in their spent pool anyway. Well, Axel is done, so now Cayman can go, and they have also been preparing to fight a monster. They're going to head over here to the fold and specifically go to the inner reef. That is going to get them two shells, and now they can fight the giant mud crab. As you can see, that one is associated with the Chronosium icon for the purposes of them taking their bonus die. So they can take the damage die, and then before they build their die pool, they are going to play the Spirit of the Tidal Blades stunt card. This says when fighting a monster, they can upgrade a number of dice equal to their spirit level. Their spirit level is currently at 2, so they have decided to upgrade two of their novice dice, each into a blue level initiate. After that, they can take a bonus die, and as you can see, they have completed a single Chronosium challenge. That means their bonus die is going to be a novice die, and their focus is at 2, so they can put both of these in here. Now, they do have one food, so they could spend that to add this die to the pool as well if they want to. Currently, they do have six shells that they can use in this battle. You know what? They've decided to go big. They have not completed as many challenges as their opponents, and they are hoping to do four damage with this attack. Well, it's now time for them to fight. So the first roll unfortunately hits a double X. Now, they did not get any blanks with the rest of their dice, so that is looking a little better. And now when they deal with this die face, they have to put a shell onto their shell shield for each of these Xs. Now, if they put just one down, that won't be enough. As long as at least one X was rolled, they would have to remove one of these dice. Fortunately for them, they have a bunch of shells, so they can put two over here. And now they can start assigning these dice. They did get a question mark, so they can use that one for a armored synergy spot. And then after that, they could put this resilience down onto that spot over there. Now, they do have another resilience, but they've decided to reroll this because they want that to be a synergy so that they could do the damage in the armored spot over there. So they can roll again, and this time went much better. They got a blank on the damage die. They got a question mark here and another resilience when they are hoping for a synergy. Now, this question mark is still fine. Uh, they could put this down onto the resilience spot, or they could go onto the spirit spot, and they've decided the spirit is probably better for them. Now, at this point, they could roll again and try to hit that synergy, or they could just spend all four of their shells from their shell shield to set this die to the face of their choice, and they've decided they're going to do that instead of risking spending more of their shells. They do have four shells left over, but of course, they can save these for future challenges and future attacks. So they figure spending those now is a good idea, so they can flip this over to a synergy, and now they are done with this attack. First things first, they can take two bumps up on the champion board for the two armored spots they hit, which means they are once again tied with Axel. Next up, Cayman can move their traits up according to the damage they did. That is going to be two synergy, one spirit, as well as one resilience. The spirit is going to get them to the three spots, so now their stunt cards that they play in the future are more powerful. Their resilience is going to get them to the two spot as well, which is great considering they have two dice in their spent pool, and then their two synergy will put them past the spot where they can play a new character card. So they can draw the top two from their deck, and they've decided to go with Generous Trainer. That says that they may pay one fruit to another character on the same island that they are currently at to increase their stunt power by two this turn. And as you can see, this is a Generous Trainer. So I'm sure the person who gets that fruit is not going to be complaining, and they could use this to do some pretty crazy stunts. Finally, Cayman can put damage down onto the giant mud crab. So those will occupy those spots right there, and there are just two spots left for damage on this monster. Of course, all of these dice will now be put back into the supply. Well, we can take our last action of the round, and I think we should also fight a monster. When the invasion happens, one of them will definitely be activated, and if we haven't done damage to either of them, then we are definitely going to take a penalty. And in addition to that, if this giant mud crab is pushed off the board, then we would also lose one spot on the champion board if we didn't do damage to it. In addition to that, just two damage will kill the giant mud crab, which would give us a kill bonus of one uh, champion bonus. So I think let's go over here, and that is going to get us two shells. Now the giant mud crab is associated with the Chronosium. 
and we have two completed Chronosium challenges, so that means our bonus die is going to be an initiate level. Now we have a blue die over here and a novice die that we are planning on rolling. And considering there are no armored spots left because our opponents got there first, let's just go ahead and take a red initiate die for our bonus. Now our focus is two, which means we can add both of these to the pool if we wanted to, although it looks like that giant mud crab only has two spots for damage and will lose all of the dice that we use, so I feel like it probably doesn't make sense to commit all of these. Now if we are committing, we may as well, I guess, uh, keep this one behind because that one is powerful for the future use, and now we can go ahead and use Drew's presence. This says before we fight a monster, we can upgrade one die, so we can upgrade this novice die, into a blue initiate. That way we have one of each going into this fight where we are trying to do one spirit damage and one resilience damage. We of course have to add the danger die and now let's try to kill that giant mud crab. At this point I feel like we might have over prepared. Obviously having our opponents get in here first let them take a lot of the lucrative spots but again hopefully we will get that kill bonus. Now we got a single damage there we got a focus and we got a synergy, so that means we got nothing that we wanted and we do have to spend a shell to mitigate that damage. Now, at this point, we could spend four of these shells to set one of these to a die face of our choice. And I think let's do that instead of waiting to spend six shells in order to refresh two dice. So all four of these will go away and we can set this one to be spirit and then let's roll these again. In this case, we got a Resilience, which is what we wanted, and we got a Blank, so that worked out great. This can go right over there, and then we did not fill any Armored Spots, so the damage won't move us up on the Champion board. Next up, we can take a Spirit and a Resilience trait increase. And for both of those, we have not unlocked a new step, but either way, it's still good to increase these as much as we can. After that, we can replace both of these spots with our damage tokens, and then, since all of the spots were filled up on the giant mud crab, the kill bonus will go into effect. Since we were the ones who actually killed the giant mud crab, we can now move up once on the champion board. This will bring us to the second spot, and now we can remove the giant mud crab. When we do this, we are actually going to leave all of the damage off to the side, because once the game is over, again, every single one of these tokens is worth one point. So right now, Cayman has four points over here in damage tokens, and we have two. The next thing that happens is every player who did at least one damage to this monster that was defeated or was chased off is then going to gain the reward, and this says we can gain an initiate die. So that means we will get one, and Cayman will also get one. At the moment, we are pretty specialized on blue, so I think let's take a red one. And Cayman has decided to take a blue one. At this point, the battle is over, although I just realized that technically, when we spent our four shells to set a die, we should have set it to a question mark, because of course our flamboyant contestant gives us one shell every time we roll at least one question mark in a battle or a challenge. Um, in retrospect, we definitely should have done that, so let's just pretend like we did. All right, our turn is over. And everyone has taken all of their turns, which means the round has come to an end. The first thing that we have to do is perform the invasion. So this die is going to be rolled, and it got a 3. Now that means if there was a monster over here, that would perform the invasion effect. And that's good for Cayman and myself, because if this was a 6, 7, or 8, then the invasion effect would cause everyone but Axel to draw an outcast token. So Axel is a little bit bummed that that did not go that way. Either way, now this can slide down and a new monster will come out. We know this one is hard because it says hard on the back, and we know this one has a weakness to the Droska Ring style of challenges. Now this is Angler's Thugs, and this is also associated with the Angler's Cove expansion. That one has a reward of letting you move plus one spot on the champion board, and you discard an outcast token, and the invasion effect says you move back one space on the champion board for each outcast token that you have when that invasion happens. Now, as you can see, this does have armored spots that are matched up with the elite level red dice, so you have to give up these dice in combat in order to fill these two damage spots in. It's now time to refresh and upgrade our dice. We have a resilience of two, so let's upgrade these two. And in this case, we can start by upgrading this blue elite die into one of the guild dice. Now we do have one challenge in our hand, which is the Ring of Chaos, and that requires at least two resilience. 
So with that in mind, I think let's take one of these Resilience Guild dice. As you can see, they have many of the double symbols, which can uh, take up a couple of these things, and these are also potentially great at doing damage to monsters. There's also no blank on it and a couple of question marks, which works out well for our character card. Next up, we can upgrade this one, and I think let's just try to be well-rounded and take a red initiate die. At the same time, Axel is also going to refresh and upgrade. They have a resilience of two, so they can refresh and upgrade both of these. And they've decided to turn this red elite die into a spirit guild die. And then this blue initiate die will turn into a blue elite. Finally, Cayman also has resilience of two, so they can refresh and upgrade both of these. And in this case, their red elite die is going to turn into one of these guilds, and they're going to go with the focus die. And after that, this novice die is going to turn into a red initiate. After that, we can collect all of our action discs. And then the judge will move clockwise to the next arena. In this case, that's going to be the Chronosium. After that, it's time to award a bonus for the single player who is highest up on the champion board. As you can see, Cayman and Axel are tied, which means neither of them are ahead of everyone else, so no one is going to get the round two bonus. Finally, the round marker will move to the third round spot, where players are still going to be rolling the yellow damage die, and at this point, the game can start once again. It looks like Axel still has the first player token, so they would once again start off the next round. Now, I am actually going to stop playing through the game at this point, and instead, I'll discuss how we get points once the game is over. Once again, the game will end after we've completed the fourth round of the game, and in that fourth round, players are going to have four actions to play with. So, once the game is over, players are going to add up their points from a wide variety of areas. The first place they will get points from are their completed challenges, and they can just add up all of these numbers on the cards they've tucked underneath their board. Next up, players will get points for each of their trade dials, equal to the highest number that they reached or passed. So you can see that each of the dials goes up to a maximum of 5 victory points, and that means there is a reason to keep bumping the dial up, even once you've reached the maximum effectiveness value of 4 on that dial. After that, players will get points equal to the highest point value that they have met or gone past on the champion board, and once again, only one player can go into this final spot, which is worth 10 points. Now, players will also get 3, 2, or 1 victory point if they are in 1st, 2nd, or 3rd place on this track. And if players tie for any of these positions, then the two tied positions are added together and divided by the number of players. Those points are rounded down and given to each of the tied players. After that, all remaining damage on monsters will be pulled off to the side of the board, and players will get one point for every damage token off in that area. Finally, players will reveal their goal and score points for it. Remember, ours was gear repairs, which would give us 7 or 10 points if we have done at least 11 or at least 13 trait advancements throughout the game. Another example is Axel over here. Theirs is Fearless Competitor, and that would give them 7 or 10 points if they have completed 4 or at least 5 of the Spirit type of challenges. You can easily tell what went into each of these challenges by seeing these icons in the bottom left of each of the ones tucked under your board. Our final example is Cayman's. This one is Heavy Lifter, and it says they have to complete challenges with four or more trait symbols on them, and they would get seven points for completing two of those, or ten points for completing three. Now, once again, they can see that each of these have two symbols on them, so they can tell that they have not reached this one at all, but you can, at a glance, look down here and see just how well you're doing on the challenge. The final scoring element to discuss only happens when playing with the Angler's Cove expansion, and that involves having all players flip over their outcast tokens, and the player with the highest overall value on those tokens is going to lose 5 victory points, and if multiple players tie for the most, then they all lose the 5 points. In addition to that, if any player flips over a token like this one, then that means that all players will lose 1 point for every outcast token that they have, and if multiple of these tokens are showing, then that means each one of these will apply that penalty to all players. After that, everyone can calculate their final scores, and the player with the most victory points will be the winner. If there is a tie, then the player who is highest up on the champion track will break the tie in their favor. If there is still a tie, then the player who has the most victory points from completed challenges will break it in their favor. And if there is a tie after that point, then the players will share in the victory. Well, at this point, I have now covered just about all of the rules to the game, and that means this tutorial is coming to a close. I hope that you've enjoyed learning how to play Tidal Blades with the Angler's Cove expansion.
As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.